Okay, so this is the last session of the day. Hello, hello. Um, hopefully you had a chance to walk outside and get some sunshine. Um, our culinary gardener was out there and it's uh, so exciting to see the lettuces and I think I saw some artichokes. Um, so if you haven't had a chance to see our gardens, um, it is a great opportunity to just soak up some vitamin D as well. Um, so we're very excited for this, this last session called Hot Girl Food and Beyond, Approaches to Making Plant-Forward Food Desirable to Consumers. Um, I am excited to bring back Bettina Macalintal, senior reporter for Eater.com, and she's got a great panel of folks who are going to talk to us about how they're uh, making uh, changing consciousness and also, you know, sort of tips for uh, making plant food, uh, you know, getting people to sort of, uh, if they haven't already, sign on to it. So, uh, Bettina, we will bring you up. Hi, everyone. Good to see you again. Okay, so we'll start with the title of the panel, right? Like, Hot Girl Food and Beyond. So, like, is there anyone on TikTok? Okay, so I'll explain. So after Megan Thee Stallion, the rapper, released the song Hot Girl Summer in 2019, people sort of across the internet, mostly younger people, embraced this idea of like hot girl as a state of mind. So if you went for a walk in the middle of the day to like clear your head, it was a hot girl walk. If you ate like a certain salad, it's like a hot girl salad. And like most notably has been the sort of rebranding of tinned fish as hot girl food. And so hot girl food, right? And so, so if you think about tinned fish, right, it's like you think about in the United States, you think about like canned tuna. It's not really like the coolest food. It's definitely like a staple and it's thrifty, but it's not like a thing you would expect sort of social media obsession over, right? But the thing we have seen is that the sort of rebranding of tinned fish as hot girl food has really, really made people excited about it sort of all over TikTok. Like this is I wrote a piece about it in 2021 for Vice, and like it's 2023 and tin fish is still everywhere and everyone's still obsessed with it. And so I think it really speaks to this idea of rebranding something into something desirable. So this thing that was very like a stodgy staple has suddenly become this like sort of big lifestyle moment where people are seeing that the, the influencers they like and the people they want to cook like online are eating a lot of tin fish. They're doing these tin fish date nights, for example where you just like, you're, you make a snack board and it's crackers and like, you know, some nice sardines. And so we're seeing that there is this like rebranding happening where these things that we took for granted, like another one happening right now is cottage cheese, just things that are very kind of like historically, maybe a little uncool, have become these like lifestyle moments and everyone wants to be a part of it. And so, so ultimately, like, I think this is sort of what we're talking about when it comes to plant-forward cooking today, right? Is trying to get people to buy into this lifestyle and this way of cooking because it feels like a moment that they want to be in and it feels like something that they want to be a part of because, you know, it speaks to like a certain value system or it speaks to, you know, this sort of like popularity thing online, like just trying to make things feel a little bit more enjoyable and accessible um, and using that as a way to get people on board. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Like, how do we get plant forward cooking to not just be like cool, but also be like kind of hot, right? You know? Um, and so we're first going to hear from Amy Cull, the uh, marketing communications engagement lead at Google's Global Food Program, who's going to do a short presentation for us. Um, you can come on up, Amy. Thanks. Thank you. And can I just say one thing? Yes. I'm so sorry. I forgot to say. So we're going to enter. Uh, Ask your questions on Slido because we're going to intersperse them throughout the conversation. Thank you for um, putting on CIA such an amazing and inspiring um, summit. It's my first time and I'm just absolutely thrilled to see all these change makers and guides for um, systemic positive solutions for our, for our climate. And I couldn't agree more. There's so many different levers we need to change. We have to have the chefs as influencers and have you showing how great and delicious that a plant forward menus can be. But we also as communicators, that's my background, um, can pull the levers of popular culture and um, social norming. And that's what I'm gonna talk to you about a little bit today. So first of all, a lot of people um, ask, why does Google have a food program? 
Why, why is Google here at a culinary summit? And we have lots of reasons. It's not just some people will say, oh, they just want to make everybody change to their desks so they can't work. Well, it is an efficiency tool and a productivity tool for sure, but it also allows people to grab a fantastic, delicious, and healthy um, plant-forward lunch with their colleagues and sit there and come up with great ideas. Um, some of our lore at Google is that we had our first chef was hired before our first human resources manager and that Gmail was invented over a casual collision during a lunchtime in one of our delicious cafes. So our food program is a convener. We see it as a conduit for social good that because we have a large scale we can um, around the world that we can affect supply chains, we can work with our chefs and our suppliers and ask them to do things that, um, that will affect other technology and large companies and corporate feeding programs around the world. So our food program builds culture, it causes casual collisions. It gives us the opportunity to have a healthy um, workforce that uh, is happy in their well-being. We have a vision and a mission that guide us um, and serve as our roadmap for the fact that we serve a quarter of a million meals every single workday in 58 countries around the world in 370 cafes. So that's pretty much the scope and size of the Google Food Program. It's much bigger than most people would expect. We, um, these are our four pillars of our objectives of, of how we support. We use our food program to att attract and retain top talent. They absolutely love the Google Food Program. It's the heart and soul of the Google culture. Tech is our brain, but our food is Google's heart. We have five food shots that we, uh, we, we use moon shots in X to develop all kinds of crazy and fantastic um, technological inventions, but we also have food shots in our food program. And the one, here are the five of them, and uh, they all aspire to do something in the future that are gonna help human health and the planet as well. The one that we're going to lean into today is obviously for this conference uh, to shift diets. And we do that at Google by having a very plant forward menu. We also have an agrobiodiverse, a robust agrobiodiverse agenda. We have water, where we consider ourselves a water forward culture. And for hydration, water is always our first choice. And we use behavioral science methods to nudge people to choose water as their beverage of choice. And we use behavioral science tenets to talk about portion control um, so that people can still have a wide variety of choices. We still have delicious desserts, but they're just in the right kind of portion that won't make a, you can have moderation in what you're eating. We absolutely believe, just like all of us are gathered here today, that we are all better together. And especially when we're looking at complex existential problems like climate change, agrobiodiversity loss, we are all better together. And so the Google Food Program works with strategic partners, such as the Culinary Institute of America, of America and um, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And if you're not familiar with Ellen MacArthur Foundation, their big goal is circularity. Google has two very large overarching goals for all of Google that have to do with carbon reduction and uh, circularity. So our food program ladders up our big objectives that we focus on, ladder up to those Google overarching goals. Ellen MacArthur Foundation brought to us as a strategic partner the opportunity to work with an organization in London called ReLondon. And this is a, the, the parliament put together this organization. It is a partnership of the mayor's office of London and all of its surrounding boroughs. And their goal is to reduce, to manage their waste streams and become more circular in the city of London and all of the boroughs. And um, they work with um, Ellen MacArthur Foundation and asked us if we would be willing and interested in becoming a sponsor of a new campaign that they're launching, it's called Eat Like a Londoner. And that's what I'm gonna to talk to you about today. 
We really liked the fact of this partnership because they had the same strategic goals and they used a lot of the communications tenets that we very much believe in and that we've worked with with the last partner on this slide is the Food for Climate League. And this is an organization that it's a 501c3 and it was uh, started with some seed money from the Google Food Program. And Michael Bacher and Siobhan Hansen, who are sitting here, were, um, were original supporters of Food for Climate League. And they do research and work with food companies and food organizations um, to look at language and how to talk about very complex, polarizing topics, such as uh, communicating about things like climate change, agrobiodiversity, loss can be very triggering for a lot of people. It's politicized, people think about climate change and they, that it's off in the future and it's not really gonna affect me, so I don't really have to worry about this today. Um, and they, and it is not a personal thing. So they, it's very easy to think, well, today I'm not gonna do this because it's not gonna make a big difference in climate change. As we're getting more um, extreme weather events, I think people are seeing it's becoming more and more personal, but still communicating about it takes um, a lot of thought and um, planning, and a lot of research has gone into this. And Food for Climate League, we work with them, and we like the fact that the uh, Eat Like a Londoner campaign followed so many of the tenets that, uh... oh, okay, this one I wasn't excited. It changed a little bit, but these were our, uh... <laughs> I don't know how that got in there. There we go. All right, this is the money slide. If you think of just one thing that I talk about today, it's this. It, first of all, this is a new report that has come out from Food for Climate League, and it's about motivating people in the workplace um, to do environmental behavior change. And they talk a lot about intrinsic motivation and how can you trigger intrinsic motivation in people. And what are the um, tenets of a good campaign? And we saw these in the Eat Like a Londoner campaign. So first of all, you can get the free report, the full report from Food for Climate League at this address here, info at foodforclimateleague.org. And it's a pretty meaty report, but it has all kinds of great tips and techniques if you're doing any kind of communications about um, climate change or trying to uh, shift diets and get people in your workplace or in your restaurant or your, your uh, back of house staff to embrace balanced plant forward or plant forward diet. These are some great tips for doing it. And um, they talk about, we talk about removing barriers. We, one thing you want to do is make the sustainable choice the easiest choice that you can, um, and doing this in communication. So remove any barriers, um, make your call to action very clear, um, and a lot of this is also operations that you would do. Um, we also want to focus, <laughs> I didn't bring my glasses, focus on the local and make it immediately relevant. So to, in order to pull back from people thinking that, that my food choice is something that's not going to affect me, it's too far in the future, all of this disaster that's going to happen, that's 2030, that's 2050, make your communications local and relevant. You'll see how they did that in Eat Like a Londoner and why we like it. Make it personal to somebody. When um, One thing I've learned in my climate communications and food communications regarding um, climate friendly choices is that when you say do this to save the planet, it does not resonate. Many, many people could care less about the planet. They just want to know what can I get on the table affordably and conveniently that's delicious tonight because I'm hungry. And thinking about saving the planet, frankly, the planet's going the planet's to go on with or without humanity. So it, that actually doesn't make a lot of sense. But um, for some people, saving um, themselves or saving some money or their time is a much more relevant um, message to get across. Um, make sure you meet people where they are. Shift them on their journey. Don't take someone who's just even beginning to consider Plant Forward as having any kind of connection to climate change, um, to ecological benefits. Uh, if they're not, if they are in certain demographic groups, they probably don't even want to talk about t climate. They just want to eat a great meal. And so just meet people where they are and any kind of small change that we can, we can motivate them through, through communications, is, is going to move people in the right direction. Avoid fear tactics. Fear tactics are not good. If you have to communicate some kind of statistic that is is going to be a frightening or upsetting to some people, then make sure that you couple that with um, some kind of 
doable, small shift in their behavior or something that they can do that is going to make them feel like, well, at least I'm doing my part. Like, I might not be able to do everything. That is a, fear, a fearful, anxiety-producing number that you just showed me or a picture of, um, you know, whales wrapped in plastic and all of that. Fear tactics are best to be avoided. And we just, uh, Google just announced yesterday, I'm really proud to ex uh, tell you all about it. It's, it's, it's a single-use plastic. It's not plant-forward, but it's a single-use plastic reduction challenge. And um, we made sure that in our communications, we weren't showing in all of them just piles and piles of garbage and the Great Pacific Ocean patch, because that can be just, people start thinking that this is just too unsolvable, it's too big, and I can't relate to that. So I might as well just um, drink one more plastic bottle or eat one more big piece of CAFO um, farmed beef. Um, Let's see, emphasize norms and collective values. So we'll get to this quickly. Emphasizing norms and collective values is what this Eat Like a Londoner campaign is doing so nicely. It launched um, in March of this year in London and in 28 of its boroughs. Um, one of our food program manager, Jim Glass, in London texted me and said, look what I found. You know, this I signed up for my neighborhood, my neighborhood, um, blanking on that, but you know, we all have those neighborhood feeds. Anyway, any like a Londoner campaign came up on it, which is, which is pretty exciting. We're going to be bringing um, the co-creating with the agency that the Eat Like a Londoner re-London is working with and bring this to Googlers in all of our London sites. And that's going to happen in September. Um, and we'll make Eat Like a Londoner at Google, bring it to life in all of our cafes, in all of our micro kitchens, in our beautiful teaching kitchen, through our classes, through all of the behavioral science um, levers that we can po possibly pull to get people at Google to feel like it's cool, like people in London eat like this. We don't, it's, it's a campaign that is both about food loss and waste, like don't waste food, but it's also highly balanced plant forward. And here are just a couple of the channels that they're going to have. Some of the messages they talk about something you know close to home, something totally doable that you can save money. Of course, everybody in these inflationary times needs to save money. So they talk about their messages talk about saving money, saving time. They're not saying save the planet and eat like a Londoner, but they're going. They're they're really getting to intrinsic motivation that people can think, oh, okay, I want to eat like a Londoner. My personal brand is that I'm someone who doesn't waste food. I'm somebody who actually eats healthy and cares about my well-being. And whether or not they behave like this every day, if we can shift day by day and just get in their head that, hey, my neighbor, my friends, my coworkers, they're doing it, it becomes peer pressure of the best positive sort. So eat like a Londoner, eat like a Londoner at Google. We're gonna be testing these messages in different ways and Ellen MacArthur Foundation and Google, we're looking to see like if we can make this work, if we can use these social normings and common language about how you can become intrinsically motivated through your personal brand to adopt these behaviors, um, we might take this pilot and find ways to roll it out in our other cities. So with that, I, we're, we're pretty excited about this and, and hopefully Siobhan or me or someone at Google will share this with you um, and it will be happening next September. Thank you. Should we just sit up here or is the pan? So um, we're going to cue that video. Uh, this is a 58-second Instagram video from farmer Luke Peterson, and um, and then I think we can uh, Bettina will. Bring it. We just wrapped up Kernza harvest for the year, and it went pretty good. Um, I'm standing on top of the combine right now in the grain tank, just checking out the sample, and it looks really good. Um, it's kind of, it's not kind of, it's really sweet standing out here in this field right now. I don't know if you can hear all the crickets and all the bugs, and the frogs, but this farm will stay like this. I'm going to drive the combine home, no tillage. There's about a foot of stubble left. 
And we'll just let this Kerns of Field green back up, cover the soil over winter, and um, let it let it do its thing. I'll come back next year and I'll harvest this field uh, for the second time. Um, so it's my honor to introduce this panel. We've got uh, Amy Paul, who's the marketing, marketing communications engagement lead at Google, is coming back. Uh, we also have Rupa Bhattacharya, the executive director of the CIA's strategic initiatives group. Um, we have Luke Peterson, an organic regenerative farmer from A-Frame Farm in Dawson, Minnesota, uh, who you just watched in the video. And we've got Katie Riker, the executive chef of Green's Restaurant in San Francisco. Um, and yeah, if anyone has questions, feel free to put them in and we will try to get to them in our conversation. All right, thanks so much for joining me today. Um, so my first question is gonna be sort of specifically for, uh, it'll be for everyone on the panel, I guess. I'd love to know sort of how in each of your work, how you, how you take this idea of sort of making these big complex ideas, how you make them personal for the people, whether it's like your diners or it's the, you know, the people you're trying to tell a little bit more about farming, Luke, or Rupa in your work sort of doing messaging. I can start if you'd like. Um, so some of you, I guess, are familiar with the work that I've done here um, in terms of messaging and how we talk about complex subjects. But one of the things that I think, and I was just talking to Katie about this earlier, but one of the things that I think has been really notable about sort of the way that we've been handling messaging over here at Strategic Initiatives Group is to really think about um, the audience and what they need and what, they, what, what they're coming to the table asking for and what we want them to walk away with, right? So it's really intentional in the way that we think about how we want people to feel when they walk away from our conferences. Do they want them to feel inspired? Do they want them to feel like they have a toolkit of the things to do? But before that, I spent um, about 20 years in media um, where, I, you know, I worked with Bettina at Vice, but before that I spent a long time in mass media, um, I was at the Food Network for a long time, and there it was really, really critical because the audience is significantly less sophisticated and also much larger. Um, so you had to do, so incremental change was both smaller, the change was both smaller and also broader, right? And so if I wanted to get a new ingredient in the magazine eventually, what I would need to do, the magazine has a longer lead time, television's a little bit shorter, digital is less so, I would need to start laundering that ingredient essentially, and laundering I should probably come up with a less illegal sounding word, but like I'd need to like, you know, I, so speaking of communication, Amy, if you've got tips, uh, but you know, I would need to, um, you know, give people that, ingredient in a context that they would recognize. Ideally, like a mac and cheese, or um, a mashed potato, or something where I could fold. If I want people, if I wanted Harissa in the magazine, it'd be like a two-year process of like getting somebody non-threatening to that audience to like have Harissa so people would know. But it was this idea of like, where are people? And what do they actually want? And what do they recognize? And how do we get that change to happen? Yeah, I would say that I've had a very similar experience at Greens. Um, we are, of course, a vegetarian restaurant, but we haven't always marketed ourselves as vegetarian restaurant. Um, so it, it, it does mention it on our website, but we don't actually talk about it when people come into the restaurant. We're really just working on giving people good food. So I try to introduce maybe some things that aren't as well known in a more well known um, area. So um, fava greens are having a moment right now. So maybe I would add that to a creamy pasta and everybody loves pasta. It's a great way to introduce it and then I can pull it into something else. Um, there's also other things that we do like a wild mushroom shepherd's pie. Everybody knows shepherd's pie. So it's a great way to add um, really good flavor. And um, it's actually kind of shocking for some people um, who may not know that um, they're eating something that's vegan or, or vegetarian, because it's just that good on its own. So as far as like, uh, you know, making it or keeping it personal with our consumers, um, for me, it's really easy as a farmer. I feel like in third grade, they taught us about our basic needs and um, so I try to link that with the products that I sell off my farm. Um, so we need things like good food, good water, um, 
and those are things that I can provide. So I try to incorporate like the crops that I grow. If you take that last video as an example, um, it can give you nutrition and it also can give our environment clean water. So I just keep it really simple with our basic needs and I feel like everybody can relate to that and that's one thing that everybody cares about. One thing that's been really fun, well, Google has a, an uplifting, our brand is uplifting, it's bright colors, it's um, somewhat whimsical, it's trying to make positive change in the world, bring information to everyone. And one thing we've done with some of our um, environmental um, initiatives, last year we had Plastic Free July, we created some characters that felt googly and we created this no waste narwhal. And because plastic, a lot of it ends up in the ocean and it's a, it was a narwhal kind, you know, the whale that has the horn. And we had uh, an engagement activity where Googlers could name it. So it's NOAA, the no waste narwhal. And we use, NOAA has, has shown up throughout the world, throughout the globe, in our micro kitchens, reminding people about plastic use reduction um, for Earth Month. This month, we, we're, our big campaign is food loss and waste reduction trying to motivate front of house Googlers to be more um, cognizant about plate waste. And so we introduced all of these, we used the, the, the technique of anthropomorphism, like the Geico gecko. And we took little strawberries and sushi rolls and croissants and different food characters and brought them to life so they were humanistic and they're riding a Google bike. So you've probably seen that G bike that's super colorful. And we have the strawberry riding it and and put it at the bottom of people's signature items. And, and, and you can learn, go to a website and learn more about um, food waste and food loss and waste reductions. We have an interior website, it's, it's called MoMA. And it just like the Google, when you go to the search bar and you, you see Google, it, just, it says MoMA and you can do a MoMA takeover. So we had all of the characters on that and they could click on it and go to a website that had all kinds of information, but we're making it fun. We're trying to build a brand that the food team cares about you, we care about the environment, but it's not scary, it's approachable and relatable. And, and we've seen some tremendous metrics showing that it's working. Um, and so on that note, since we watched one of your videos, Luke, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more sort of about how social media fits into your, the work that you do and how, it, how you sort of build new relationships or convey what you're working on. Um, and can you tell us also a little bit more about sort of what you're doing as a farmer? Sure. So uh, I'm an ROC certified, so that's a regenerative organic certified uh, farmer from Midwestern Minnesota. Um, and we have a systems approach to agriculture so we look at the social aspect, uh, the environmental, and um, yeah, so I won't go too far into that, but uh, certified organic regenerative farmer. And to bring the social media aspect into that, um, I worked with a doctor for a short while that came to the Midwest from California. And one thing he kept asking me when he got to the Midwest was, where's all the food? And, um, you know, we live in the middle of corn and soybean country. Um, and I quickly realized that I needed to start growing food. And, you know, he told me if I change my farming practices to where I'm at now, he said, make sure you document it along the way. And that was about 10 years ago. Instagram was fairly new. It was, for me, it was as simple as picking up the phone while I was in the middle of a task and telling everybody what I was doing and why I was doing it. Um, and, you know, with these complex issues, one thing that I've really focused on or noticed about messaging is that in a complex system like what we have, it's really important to pick one topic at a time and uh, focus on that before you move on to the next one. And just not to get too far into it, keep it positive, and uh, that's been working. So. Great. That's awesome. Um, and so one thing I was wondering, Katie, so Greens has been open since 1979, is that right? Cool. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about how sort of the increase in sort of interest in plant-forward eating has influenced what you're able to put on menus and how you decide like what you're gonna try out at the restaurant? Totally, yeah. So um, Greens has been open since 1979, so we have 44 years of plant-based cooking. Um, so in 1979, our opening chef, Deborah Madison, really relied a lot on dairy and a lot on 
very um, comforting, um, filling, heavy foods because she was so afraid that people would miss the meat because it wasn't an established cuisine yet. Um, over the years, once people realized that plant-based food is actually delicious and it's great to eat plant-based even once in a while, um, the food really lightened up. We started to move a little bit more towards a Mediterranean influence, relying heavily on olive oils and, and healthier ingredients um, while still taking this world approach and of course being farm focused. Um, now, I'm seeing a huge push, not only just towards plant-based or vegetarian, but specifically veganism has taken a really strong foothold in the last few years. And because there's so many amazing products um, and companies that are making plant-based substitutions, um, it's not enough to just take something out. Maybe in the 90s, if somebody was vegan, it was rare and we could just omit the butter and we wouldn't substitute anything else in it. Now that's not enough. So we're working pretty hard on um, bringing in some products and, and being creative in the kitchen to create substitutes. So we rely heavily on like cashew creams and, and some dairy-free uh, milks and, and things like that while still keeping our attention on the farms and making sure that it's a sustainable practice that we can incorporate into the kitchen. Um, so while we'll never really use meat substitutes because that's just not our thing, we are looking towards um, providing a one-for-one -one substitute and making sure that almost everything on the menu can be made vegan at all times. That sounds great. Um, and so one question from the audience is, we often learn the most through our failures and what hasn't worked. Can you each speak to some of your failures in regards to messaging and what you learned from them? Um, I guess we can start with Rupa. <laughs> I've got so many failures. Uh, <laughs> I got to pick one. Um, no, I mean, I think there are a lot of t things that have been really tricky over, over the years. Um, you know, there are questions about what audiences were ready for, um, what, you know, what we could say, what we couldn't say, what would, you know, do well. Um, like, I wrote two beginner cookbooks um, about 15 years apart from each other. I wrote one in 2005. One came out in 2005, one came out in 2019, something like that. And, like, what I was able to do between those two books was, like, night and day a game changer, right? And, like, there was maybe, like, a vegetarian recipe in the first one. Um, and, it, like, or maybe there wasn't even a vegetarian recipe outside of the salad chapter or outside of, like, and, like, what we could do in the, in the next book. And now that I look back on the 2019, 2019 book, I still think about it and I'm like, this could have used a lot more plant forward recipes. Um, you know, and I think that even, you know, the cookbook lead time is so long and it takes a while to develop these things. And like, I think that I could have absolutely anticipated better what the demand would have been then um, for sort of plant forward slash vegan friendly recipes. A good failure. I've got more failures, so we can think about more. <laughs> well, I have a failure. I have lots of failures, but this is a good one. <laughs> um, when I was at Edelman, I this was in about 2018, I think, and I was and Chef Anthony Mint, Mint, who I'm sure many of you know who he is, he was kind of a mentor of mine, and I would be had become just absolutely enthralled with his perennial restaurant and perennial kerns of grain and how deep the roots are and how good it is for the soil. And I was invited, we were presenting to a Midwestern dairy company. This is all about your message resonating and meeting people where they are in their journey. And I brought a, a gal um, who headed up the Kashi account and they were doing transitional um, organics. And so we thought, oh, the two of them, we could talk to them and, and share. And, I, and it was a lot of their top executives and we were talking about sustainability. And I had suggested, I, I got up and I was telling them all about the roots and the perennial grain and, um, and long root ale and Patagonia provisions and all this stuff. And they just weren't ready for it. And I think that um, when I left and I came back, they, they told the Chicago office, we don't want to see them again. <laughs> and I was like, oh, you know, I, it, it just felt like a big kick in the stomach, but it was such a good learning that they were not ready to be jumping from where they were to feeding their cows perennial grains, which I still think was a good idea. But it was just ahead of its time. So timing is everything, I could say. Yeah. Um, I'm embarrassed to say this, but I'm going to tell you the truth. Early on, um, you know, with social media, which was the worst place to do it, brought in politics with the Farm Bill. So the Farm Bill is very controversial for many reasons. 
I will, you know, looking back, that was a mistake. Um, but what I do is, you know, what I'm competing against are the policies in agriculture. And it's very difficult to do. That's why I brought it up, because I think that's where we should start. But it's not where you start when you're messaging. And that was my, probably my biggest failure. Um, for me, I think um, some of the failures I've had in the last three years as executive chef have been um, in sort of connecting to guests, I guess, by way of menu um, descriptions, I suppose. So um, Greens has always taken a world approach to menus, but I've taken that a step further. I've tried to be a lot more diverse with the menu, reach farther, um, be more inclusive. Um, I've brought in guest chefs who are experts in their own cuisines, et cetera. But sometimes when I put something on the menu that is not really well known for people, um, I want to put it on in a way that really still represents the cuisine that I'm trying to honor um, without appropriating, but then sometimes it just doesn't translate to guests because they read the menu so quickly that they end up not ordering it at all. So um, what I've learned in the last few years is to really be careful with how I'm naming things on the menu and also providing a ton of information for our front of house staff to make sure that they can adequately describe these things that are really so wonderful, but maybe they're just not as popular or they haven't really come over here um, to the mainstream yet. Um, and that's actually a great tie-in to this one question we got, which is, um, I think this would apply to both Luke and Katie, but would you recommend direct naming of specific food varieties on menus, or do you think it's better to not uh, confuse the consumer? Um, so, yeah, so I think you mean like a specific variety of like peaches or something. Um, yeah, you know, I think um, people read menus in 30 seconds and they know what they want. So while it is really nice um, to list specific varieties, I think um, for my purposes, I try to keep it as simple as I can. I um, actually don't even list the farmers on the menu anymore because it's just, it's, it's, it takes up space. Um, very valuable space. Um, but one thing that I do is I make a master ingredient list and that's kind of tying back into the information that I provide for our front of house. So on this list I have a column for the dish itself, a column for the allergens, a column for all the farmers associated with it with a breakdown of which thing comes from which farmer. Um, a full list of ingredients including things if we use canned tomatoes I'm listing citric acid and things like that. Um, and then um, some notes and a one-liner. It's a huge document, it takes forever to update. <laughs> um, but it's really helpful so that when guests come and see grilled peaches, they're already interested in it. If they're grilled peaches, everybody orders that. But when you say these are um, summer Z peaches from Blossom Bluff Orchards, that just helps them connect to it even more. And I find that for me and for Greens, it just resonates a little bit better when it comes table side. So. Oh kind of do the best I can with this. Um, so for me, it, it might be more so of like certifications um, instead of like specific varieties of certain products. Um, and if I can just, you know, use Kearns as an example, there's gonna be some new upcoming perennial grains that are coming. Um, you know, and if you use perennial grains, just is gonna, for me, I would rather if, you know, we focused on a specific type of perennial grain because of the differences between the varieties. Um, like Kernza, for example, is being developed specifically um, because of its root system and its ability to capture carbon. There are other perennial wheats out there that have the same root system as annual wheat. Granted, we're um, still doing less tillage and less planting and things like that, but we're missing out on the ability to store carbon the way we are with uh, a grain specifically like Kernza. Um, and then like with labels, or, uh, which can be confusing, they're ever evolving, they're always changing. Uh, consumers don't have a lot of time to educate themselves on them, uh, are very important. Um, and you have the organic standards, you have natural, sustainable, whatever. Um, and then now another new one, that's ROC, 
has three ladders within it. So very, very time consuming to educate yourself on all of that. But each ladder is very specific and creates a very different uh, landscape. So yeah, I would say they are important. Um, just encourage you know consumers to take their time and educate themselves. Can I jump in on this one as well? I think there's something really interesting about the needle that you need to thread with naming and understanding that people are going to come to you looking for a certain thing, but also not overwhelming them with information. So if they want real peaches, they might be searching. I don't know if you saw the meme, there was like a restaurant that was like Thai restaurant near me or Thai food near me or something like that. And it's like when SEO takes over your, like, takes over your business, right? Like it's, so someone's searching that. So people do search for things, right? They're gonna search for grilled peaches or something like that. And it's like, how do you, What's the needle? You know, like when we were at Vice, we had an SEO person come in and tell us that people really search for beef stew. So could we rename our birria, which was made with lamb, to Mexican beef stew? And it was like, no, because it's lamb, right? Like, you know, like, but you know, like people are searching for these things, and how do you get to the point where they're they want beef stew? So you know, this is a beef stew, sure, or it could be. Um, you know, like there's a there's a really difficult, and I think the way that you hand both of you handle it with giving people sort of the baseline of what they're looking for. This is a well-raised grain, essentially, or this is a grilled peaches dessert up front. And then the ability to dive down, I think, is really valuable as well. Oh, did you have thoughts, Amy? No. Oh, okay. um, actually, Rupa, that goes into a great question that we got from the audience, which is, what if any role, I think when it comes to sort of inspiring these sorts of dietary changes, what if any role does clickbait play? Does, does it work, or does it just make people feel duped? I think it's both. I mean, I think it's absolutely both. I think clickbait plays an enormous role. I mean, I've been out of media for a couple of years, but like there are still, I mean, I'm so I no longer fortunately have to spend that much time looking at bad TikTok food. Um, so, you know, God bless, sorry, Bettina, but like, yeah. Um, but it's hard, no, it's, I mean, I do think that there are these sh massive shifts that do take place because, you know, people are saying I'm eating this feta, you know, tomato feta thing, or I'm eating this, you know, um, your kale pesto, or, you know, and I think that is absolutely valuable. Clickbait is such an interesting word, too, because, like, every, like, six months or three months, this, like, debate flares up about people telling their life stories and the head notes of, of, of recipes. And, you know, there's reasons for that that also go back to sort of SEO. But um, people do want some sort of relationship to, um, and there is a sort of semi-parasocial relationship that people have to the creators of things, right? So if, like, so-and-so makes this salad, and you want to be like so and so, you're going to do it. And so there's all these things that do take off, I think, you know, because, you know, people uh, because of influence, right? Um, but yeah, yeah. I mean, this is not a question, but yeah, I think the thing for me that really stands out is that I think a lot of these lifestyle changes and like, you know, sort of this like covert messaging around it on social media is now happening through in a much smaller scale. It's not like there's one magazine that's driving everything. It's kind of like everyone is sort of finding their pocket of people who seems to align with like the lifestyle that you want, for example. Um, and I think that's really nice to see that like these little micro communities online can actually like inspire that much change, for example. Um, and so, Amy, we've got a question for you. Um, in addition to the tools available through menus of change, what other resources do you use to determine marketing strategies around your messaging? Oh, okay, that's a good question. Um, we are very, obviously Google is a very big data company, and so we respect and, and care about data very much. And we have the, we have food a food ethnographer that is hired and, and does um, all types of research. She travels the globe and does, and talks to Gen Z and talks, I really enjoyed that part of the presentation, um, talks to our users and to find out what do they want, what do they need, and we have very different let's say people in an engineering building want have very different needs for a food program than our sales force that's out in the field. Um, we look at you know a lot of the same types of, of data and trends that um, you could get from that, that when I worked for CPG companies and agencies that we would use but at, at Google what I found it, we have the luxury of having behavioral scientists like Siobhan, you know, who has incredible training and she's conducting our own research. Um, in this London situation, for example, in Dublin and London, um, Siobhan is overseeing a program where we brought in some AI equipment and some um, Orbisk uh, waste finder cameras that are gone on when you do the dish drop. And to, they're actually looking at 
what is on people's plates. And I won't, the, the findings were really interesting, but I won't tip the hand. <laughs> That'll be another presentation. However, um, the, that kind of data is incredible. And we made sure that they moved their napkins so that the um, cameras could actually see what was being left on the plates. Um, and so it's an incredibly intentional program. And so when we're doing our marketing campaigns, um, that uh, behavioral inter intervention, well, first of all, finding out the plate waste, but we're testing common language for, for instance, when people say, I would ha I'd like to have a size, um, please give me a serving of something. Well, what, do they, what does it mean, a serving? It could be a big spoon, it could be a half a spoon, it could be a micro tasting serving. So we're doing some testing of language along um, you know, what actual serving size is, are. This is all in service of reducing plate waste front of house. Um, and the social norming campaigns are really important. So we're investing both in-house with our in-house resources and um, and using and working with our partners too. Amazing. Um, and so, yeah, Rupa, I was wondering, how does, how does this idea of social norming sort of fit into your work as well? Um, I think it's a tremendous part of what we do. I think, you know, because there's social norms on both sides of things, right? There's social norms on the operator side. There's also social norms on the consumer side. And again, this is one of those things that in order to fully get the message across or change people's eating habits, you sort of have to be playing sort of both sides of the field here, right? So it's not just that like, Gen Z wants more vegetables or Gen Z wants more vegan options. I mean, that's absolutely a huge thing, but it's also like, so, but you know, but also the, the restaurants need to say, well, if so, if I'm not gonna serve, you know, a vegan option, so-and-so down the block is. And so there is this idea there that when you build enough of a sort of a, a flywheel effect, essentially of, of pressure, that that ball starts rolling and people generally like sort of catch up and go along. But this idea that you were talking about with like, um, to make it cool, to make it desirable, to eat, you know, locally, or to eat, you know, th these things all happen sort of in micro communities. Like Bettina and I were talking yesterday about something, and it came up that like we both know many people who have bought and renovated old churches, and like that's such a tiny influencer community, but also both of us know those people, and like you know there are these things where like, these tiny communities where one person or multiple people who are like, well, this is a thing you can do, and and it catches on, and it happens so quickly. Yeah, totally. And so on a similar note, Katie, one thing I'm wondering is, you know, you like you're you said so you were sort of mentioning the idea of like a vegetarian restaurant and how greens like emphasizes the idea of celebrating vegetables. One thing I'm wondering is I think a lot of people still sort of do have preconceived notions about what vegetarian food is or they've had bad experiences with it. How are you sort of overcoming that to try to bring in a new audience um, of people who might not necessarily be, you know, strictly vegetarian, but are just interested in vegetables? Um, yeah, so, you know, I'm a CIA alum, um, I'm classically trained, so when I think of my menus, I'm not really always thinking, how do I make something vegetarian taste good, or how do I win over these people? I'm thinking about texture, I'm thinking about acid, I'm thinking about um, the components of a, of a dish that, whether it has meat or not, it has to have those things to taste good. So. Um, I feel like if you treat the food as food and not as something that is other or as something that is um, sp specific to a diet, um, you don't really need to do a lot of convincing because it just tastes good as it is. Um, of course, there are some skeptics. Um, I joked earlier that there's always a family that has a vegetarian daughter and a really grumpy dad who didn't want to come into greens. but. You know, we try to make it as approachable as possible. There's pasta on the menu. There's pizza on the menu. Um, right now, I'm doing a the, that mushroom shepherd's pie. Things that are um, recognizable that you know people can try it out, and they usually end up being really pleasantly surprised if they were grumpy about it in the beginning. I also think there's something really interesting about um, the idea of approaching vegetarian food outside of like it being a one-to-one -one swap for meat or other protein or animal protein. Like the idea, it's the same, same way when you change any system of power, right? When you change a system of power, you can't just do a one-to-one -one swap at the top and say, here's the, the main thing on the plate, it's going away. Like here's the, the new thing, everything else is the same, right? In order to change expectations in any system change, you have to, the thing that is powerful needs to cede that power. So thinking about a vegetarian dish as not 
this like some vegetables on the side and then something replaces the meat in the middle versus like what the full scope of what vegetarian food can look like is a really big emotional thing that I think um, is happening you know over time I think we're all seeing it um, but that's something that gen genuinely I think needs to happen culturally um, in order for sort of full-scale buy-in to happen. Yeah, and I think, like, just speaking personally as someone who does kind of post to my cooking online, and it's, you know, very plant-forward, and, like, you know, I don't really cook a lot of meat, for example. Um, the thing I found is that, like, yeah, like, I've never built it as, like, vegetarian food, but I think that when you just show people, like, mushrooms that look really, really good, they get really on board with it, and it's, it doesn't have to be framed as, like, a mushroom al pastor or a mushroom anything like that. It can just be, like, a really good mushroom. Yeah, totally. Um, and so I wanted to go back to one thing Luke was saying was sort of about all of this education and sort of figuring out, you know, you mentioned all the different certifications. And so I guess I'm wondering when it comes to people who want to, you know, want to know more, how do you recommend approaching that education in the first place and figuring out like what's sort of what's worth paying attention to? Uh, uh, the Internet is, you know, Google <laughs> <laughs> pretty much. Uh, honestly, like you can sort through it and you have to sort through it on your own. Uh, there's so much out there. Um, you got to do your own research. Internet's full of it. Um, do we have any final questions for the panel? And I could add something to that too. Um, probably the best way to do it is to like visit your local farmers. Um, there ain't a farmer out there that would turn you down, no matter how they're doing it. They're all super like. Uh, proud of what they do every day and probably lonely <laughs> to be honest <laughs> you know they're out there working every day doing their thing doing the best they can and um, if you asked them like if you got on social media and found one or two or whatever and asked them hey can I stop by I'm about a hundred percent sure that they're gonna say yes and if they say no well that ain't the place to go anyway ask another one because <laughs> they will love it if you come out because um, yeah because Tell them, you know, ask them what's the best t uh, time of year when you're not busy to come out and visit and ask them about the way they do things, what certifications they follow, and you'll get a really good feel about how dynamic it really is. Yeah, I think that's definitely a great way to make, to go back to that idea of sort of making things personal. Like, if you go to the farm, it's definitely personal. <laughs> um, great, well, thank you everyone so much for, for all the great questions. Did anyone want to add anything? No, I didn't. <laughs> well, I was about to talk to you. Just thank you. Thank you for this panel. Thank you for, and I guess I would say the chefs and the farmers. Um, you guys make it happen, and you are the role models, and it'd be great um, to make rock stars out of celebrity farmers. Uh, that would be really cool. I mean, that's the way things get done around in, the, in this country for sure. <laughs> to Bettina for a great job moderating. Um, thank you to the panelists. I really love the, the kind of uh, synergy that's been happening, especially when Amy was talking about Kernza and I was like, oh my gosh, Luke's right next to her talking about Kernza. <laughs> and, you know, and uh, farmers too. So, so that was really great. Um, so uh, thanks to all of you. We get to go now upstairs to Heston Kitchen. And here, if you just want to take these stairs up, uh, uh, up, if you would like to take the stairs upwards, Heston Kitchen will be on your right. Uh, we will be uh, sampling tastings from the Hands-On Innovation Kitchen Workshops with East Abel Fridge and Roxana Julepot. So we're gonna get lots of great bold flavors. We're gonna get uh, amazing grains. I saw some scones earlier that they were making. So just try everything. Um, it's always great uh, to end and be in the kitchen. And it's just uh, thank you so much to everyone. Um, thanks to our panelists and our presenters. And we'll see you next year.
친구가 그 식절에는 생명체가 있습니다. 자기가 어, 음, 땅에다가 뿌리를 박고 태양열과 있을까 별빛과 달빛에 의해서 성장 과정을 하고 있습니다. 그럴 때에 하나하나 모든 게 소중하지 않는 것이 없습니다. 뿌리라서 못 먹는 거에서 잘라서 버리거나 또 줄기가 안 먹는다 해서 그대로 통째로 어, 이렇게 음, 쓰레기통 나가는 거는 원치 않습니다. 그래서 어, 우리 음, 사찰 음식과 이 불교 음, 음식에는 모든 것을 생명체를 어, 존중하고 유지하기 위해서 통째로 음식을 합니다. 뿌리는 뿌리대로, 줄기는 줄기대로, 잎은 잎대로, 꽃은 꽃대로, 열매는 열매대로 모든 것을 통째로 하는 음식을 어, 우리는 전체 음식이라고 합니다. 그래서 각자가 갖고 있는 맛과 향과 이런 것이 틀리기 때문에 뿌리를 해서 그냥 전혀 버리 만드는 거죠. 만약에 식재료를 하면서 이런 음, 요런 찌꺼기가 요런 부분이 나왔을 때는 이런 거를 전부 다 함께 모아서 끓입니다. 끓이면 그거를 어, 내가 물 대신 먹을 수 있고 또 채소를 내서 음식할 때 국물로도 사용을 합니다. 그래서 온전한 음, 그 식재료가 갖고 있는 어, 모든 생명체를 온전히 지켜주는 겁니다. 그랬을 때 우리는 그 음식이 어, 지속 가능한 그런 거를 함께 해주는 겁니다. 이 올바른 두부 응? 먹으면 은 부드럽고 식감이 있고 영양이 충분한 단백질을 섭취해주고 하는 이 두부를 우리는 계속 먹을 수 있는 거예요. 언제 어느 때 인간의 욕망으로서 응? 이 종자 씨앗을 멸망을 시킬 수가 있다면 은 이거 못 먹어요. 그러한 지속 가능한 음식을 합니다. 그래서 두부는 역사적인 겁니다. 고추, 깨소금, 오미자청, 만드는 방법은 간단합니다. 양념도 어, 모든 음식은 자꾸 양념을 보태가고 뭐 자꾸 놀라해서 힘들어요. 음식 식재료가 갖고 있는 막는 전체를 끄집어내고 할 적에는 그 자꾸 양념을 빼야 돼. 자꾸 덜어내야 본연의 맛이 나오는 거예요. 이거 진리입니다. 진리. 음식을 만들고 요리하는 진리예요. 자꾸 양념 뭐 놀라니까 힘들다는 거지. 그래서 기본적인 거 처음에 할 때에 있던 그거 해서 마지막에는 깨소금만 넣었어요. 자 이렇게 해서 오이하고 두면이랑 같이 해서 만들어 봤습니다. 두면 오이, 두수, 무침을 해봤습니다. 아, 저런 식재료를 가지고 우리의 전통 식재료인 두부에다가 같이 함께 하면 이 음식이 하나로서 온 세계가 하나가 되지 않나. 이런 뜻에서 오늘 아스파라거스하고 두부하고 같이 함께 음식을 해봤습니다. 이 아스파라거스는, 어, 그냥, 어, 물에 데쳐서 소금강과, 어, 생강, 음, 그리고 어, 고추 말린 거 넣고 그대로입니다. 여기에 들어간 두부는 또 식감을 소금 부드럽고 겉은 바삭하게 어, 바삭하게 빠른 불로 얼른 구워내야 어, 그 식감을 살릴 수가 있어요. 어, 겉은 바삭바삭하고 겉, 속은 부들부들한 게 두부의 참맛이거든요. 그거를 이제 살려서 이제 음식을 하는 겁니다. 
제가 항시 어, 교육적으로 음식을 통해서 교육을 하고자 하는 게 음, 지금 기후 위기를 살려 두 번째는 자연 환경 보호를 해야 돼요. 자연 환경. 내가 자연과 함께 있고 인간과 자연은 하나이기 때문에 내가 함께 해야 된다는 거예요. 그러면은 함부로 할 수가 없는 거죠. 자연을 내 몸같이 생각한다. 자연을 환경 보호를 해서 있는 그대로 흘러가도록 해야 나도 그대로 가. 식 배추 포기 김치를 담가 보겠습니다. 한국인들이 가장 많이 먹는 김치가 역시 배추 포기 김치인데요. 이 김치는 어, 조선 시대부터 먹기 시작했지만 지금처럼 이제 빨갛게 고춧가루가 들어가서 어, 김치를 담그기 시작한지는 1890년대니까 100년 남짓 됐어요. 이제 배추가 보통 한 3, 4kg 정도 되거든요. 가운데를 가운데를 딱 나눠서 이렇게 되면 이거를 반쯤 이렇게 여기가 심이라고 해요. 배추 심. 여기를 나눠줘야 가운데 소금물이 들어가서 절임이 잘 돼요. 소금물을 만들어주는 거예요. 그리고 충분히 이렇게 적셔주세요. 이 절임이 잘 돼야 김치가 맛있거든요. 이렇게 좀 떨어뜨려 놔줘야 소금이 들어가겠죠. 소금을 한 주먹을 딱 쥐고 사이사이에 줄기 부분에 넣어주세요. 이렇게 이게 절임이 잘된 거예요. 특히 김치는 소금의 역할이 굉장히 중요하거든요. 그래서 저는 소금을 꼼꼼하게 따져서 반드시 국산 천일염을 씁니다. 예. 김치할 때 5대 양념이 있어요. 그게 파, 마늘, 생강, 아, 마늘, 생강, 그 다음에 고추, 젓갈이래요. 무채를 썰어요. 제가 김치에 제일 많이 쓰는 과일이 배요, 배. 지금부터 김치가 어떻게 버무리는지 설명을 드릴게요. 맨 먼저 고춧가루로 고춧물을 이렇게 들여놔줘요. 액체로 이때 여기 다시 마무리하는 역할이 이거를 이렇게 농도를 맞춰주는 역할을 하는 거예요. 그 다음에 마늘, 생강 넣고요. 그리고 어, 액젓으로 한번 더. 그리고 새우젓, 생새우 들어가요. 채소를 같이 버무려주고요. 자, 이때쯤에서 이제 공을 죽을 넣는 거예요. 김치는 정답이 없어요. 가족들이 지역에 따라서 어, 그 가문에 따라서 김치 담그는 방식은 다 다르다는 거. 자 이렇게 싸주는 이유는 어, 그냥 괜히 심심해서 싸는 게 아니고요. 안에 있는 양념이 밖으로 빠져나오지 못하고 다 익을 때까지 맛있게 양념이 이 줄기 속으로 뵐수 있는 시간을 주는 거예요. 꼭꼭 눌러서 공기를 완전히 빼주고요. 그리고 공기하고 접촉되는 부분이 없이 이렇게 다 접, 덮어줘요. 이거 굉장히 중요한 거라고 그랬어요. 김치는 이제 외국인들이 볼때 배추에 고춧가루 묻혀져 있는 것만 김치로 생각하지만 꼭 그렇지 않아요. 파프리카를 이용해서 어, 백김치를 담글 거예요. 파프리카가 이제 푸른색은 피망을 썼고요. 노란색 파프리카고 어 이건 무채예요. 무채하고 배를 이 배를 채를 썰었어요. 원래 전통적인 백김치에는 이제 그 대추채, 마늘채, 생강채, 밤채, 
어, 서기체가 들어가요. 이렇게 국물에다 새우젓 국물에다가 어, 마늘 생강 조금 넣어서 소금간 해가지고 이렇게 부어요. 그래서 공기하고 접촉을 차단시켜줘야 되는 거. 이제 지금부터는 콜라비로 김치를 담가 볼 텐데요. 이게 콜라비예요. 이게 네덜란드에서 씨앗이 왔다고 하거든요. 그런데 이 콜라비를 이제 반으로 나, 나눠서 이렇게 껍질을 까면 이렇게 됐거든요. 이렇게 썰었으면 소금에 절여야 돼요. 이거는 보통 김치에 담그는 그런 고추 분말이고요. 이건 고운 고춧가루인데 이걸 쓰는 이유가 이게 여기에서 수분이 나와서 어 색깔이 하얗게 돼버릴까 봐 그래서 이걸 미리 이렇게 해줘 이렇게 뭐 줄줄줄 해주면 고춧물이 곱게 들어요 그래서 가루를 다양하게 쓰는 거예요 역시 김치는 이제 어 금방 먹었 담가서 바로 먹으면 그 채소에 채소와 양념에 들어있는 영양 성분을 먹겠지만 김치의 핵심은 발효예요 발효 시간이 만들어주는 맛과 영양이 있거든요 김치의 유산균이 하는 역할은 우리는 여러 가지 음식을 먹었을 때장 속에 유해균과 유익균이 있어요 유해균이 비중이 높으면 장이 건강하지 않은 거고 유익균이 비율이 높으면 장이 건강한 거예요 그걸 김치의 유산균이 유해균이 유익균으로 변하는 그런 역할을 해요 그래서 김치가 건강한 식품이고 김치 유산균은 장까지 살아서 들어간다 그래요 그래서 건강한 음식인 것 같아요 왔던 한식 요리사 셰프 조희숙입니다. 장아찌 저장 방법이 네네. 이제 저장을 시킬 수 있는 그러니까 네. 미생물이 활동하기 어렵게 만드는 조건 중에 하나 그 염도가 네. 고추장으로 또는 된장으로 간장으로 이 고추장 간장 된장은 한식의 대표적인 양념이고 아주 고유한 맛이기 때문에 에, 채소에도 단지 이렇게 저장하는 음식이 세계 여러 나라에 있을지라도 한국 장아찌가 특별한 것은 이렇게 고추장, 된장, 간장으로 할수 있다는 것이 그러니까 염도로 미생물의 활동을 억제하는 것 뿐만 아니라 이 고추장이, 된장이, 간장이 가진 그 맛을 특별히 또 여기다 넣는 그런 음식이 되는, 보자, 저장 음식이 되는 거죠. 그래서 이세 가지가 다 활용이 되는 저, 채소 저장 방법으로 그래서 이제 이거는 보여드렸고 이제 된장과 고추장 다 이렇게 채소를 해서 저기 저장을 할 수가 있는데 대량으로 이제 그할 경우에 그 계절에 많이 나오는 게 맛도 가장 좋고 가격도 좋고 상태가 가장 좋은 상태라서 그때 저장을 해 놓는 거거든요. 그래서 그것을 1년, 2년 저장을 잘 하면 그 이상으로도 먹을 수 있는 그런 것이 채소 저장 음식이에요. 이제 이렇게 아까 그 간장도 떠오르지 않게 눌렀잖아요. 지금 된장이나 고추장도 이렇게 재료가 겉에 보이지 않게 다 덮어주는 게 중요하거든요. 일단 공기 밖에 나왔다 하면 상하는 거예요. 이렇게. 요걸 꺼내서 이렇게 먹는 거죠. 단지 그 짜게 절여진 것 말고 그 된장의 여러 가지 감칠맛과 그 숙성된 맛을 채소에서 같이 느낄 수 있는 그런 이제 약간 일종의 슬로우 푸드이면서 건강 음식이죠. 1년 이상 보관이 되고 냉장 시키면은 그 이상도 가요. 이제 요즘 그 짜게 안 드시니까 이거 염도를 
낮추는 경향이 있거든요. 장아찌를 그럼 염도를 낮추면은 이제 원래는 이게 밖에서 다 있었던 옛날 오래 전부터 있었던 건데 이제 짜게 해놨기 때문에 상하지 않는데 이걸 염도를 낮추겠다 하면은 냉장 보관하면은 1년, 2년도 가능한 저장 음식이죠. 이제 이런 음식이 그 한국 음식의 그 근간이 될수 있었던 이유는 밥이 있기 때문에요. 얘하고 이제 밥하고 먹으면 그냥 딱 답이죠, 그게. 그러니까 한식은 밥문화다. 밥이 주인 문화이고 그래서 이 간장, 된장, 고추장으로 만든 이 반찬들이 밥과 함께 어우러진 것이 한국 음식의 아주 그 주맥, 가장 그 주된 흐름이죠. 지금은 이제 이것만 일품으로 먹으면 못 먹잖아요. 반드시 밥이 있어야죠. 그러니까 밥을 빼놓고는 이제 한국 음식을 설명할 수가 없는데 그렇기 때문에 간장, 된장, 고추장이 결국은 우리 한식 문화의 바탕이 기본이 될 수가 있는 거죠. And this is going to resemble tuna. Yeah. It's almost like a vegetarian tuna. Okay, you don't get nice tuna like that everywhere, huh? <laughs> that, with that good color. Yeah, so maybe a little extra wasabi is nice. Yeah. Very quick, very quick uh, nigiri. Okay. So that's our first course. Yeah, a little pepper. A little pepper. Okay, so okay, next one. then let's move on to uh, avocado because we're in California, right? Okay, good. Yep, yeah, yeah. Do you so have a lot of avocado in Japan too? Or what? Not a lot. We import them all. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to have to go and show them how to go. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, avocado is being scooped up almost yeah. like a shape of fish eggs. Uh-huh. And uh, it's, it's soaked in uh, basil oil. Mm-hmm. So you have nice basil oil. We're going to turn this into like a gunkan style. So we'll do avocado. And the gunkan. How about a little chili? I think that's a good I idea. I Let's like when it's bit. spicy. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So All right, look second, at that. Of course. So we did salmon pearls. Salmon pearls. Yeah. So we're going to do uh, uni. Uni, okay. Vegetarian style. My favorite, you yeah. know. So we made really small, beautiful farmer's market uh, butternut, squash. butternut squash, baby one. We yeah. roast it really slow, so mm -hmm. it's nice and, nice and sweet. Uh, and we're caramelizing the miso on top, as oh, you can okay. see, that's yeah, miso. Yeah. And we cooked it really, really hard in, in, at the end, so that it gets that it nice, browns and yeah, it gets nice yeah. torch. Get the flavor. Right, so we'll do this one with cucumber. You know, I'm going to send a picture to, to Byron in uh, south of France. You know, yeah. at Beaumanier, yeah. Uh -huh. He's working there. He's working there, yeah. You know, he was always like into his uh, vegetarian sushi too. So he I always said we have to make uh, different ones all the time. Mm -hmm. Oh, it looks like uni the color. It huh? does. So, scoop up a little bit of this. 
So miso is very strong in flavors. I don't think I need any. Anything? Soy sauce on top, or maybe you can garnish over the flour. Okay. So that's our uni course. Okay. okay. Sorry, I need to tuck the water. How about we do cucumber next? Okay. It's very simple. So a lot of work is, has done been done already. So this you, is... You roasted them? We pickled it. We pickled them, So okay. we pickled them in sugar, salt, and yeah. mustard. You want to taste a little bit? Uh-huh. So Ooh, it's still crunchy, but... It's it, nice and crunchy, yeah. yeah. So we'll cut it. And then I make a lot of incision, so it's uh, yeah. easier to eat. Mm, how about we do this with the red... red uh, yeah. So this one has shiso. You know, yeah. cucumber and shiso is a very good friend. Yeah, you know? they're good friends in Japan and here yeah. too. Yeah. So we go like that, and then we have a little band of nori. If it doesn't fall off. Okay. Okay. And then we're going to garnish this with this cucumber wow. flour. Wow, beautiful. Yeah, just on top like that. So people go, wow. It's our cucumbers. So we're into fifth course now. Yeah. How about we do uh, another squash course, but different squash. Okay. So here's delicata squash. Uh-huh. It's been roasted for about 45 minutes until super tender. And we already stuffed with sushi rice. Okay. But it's a, uh, it's a mixture of jalapeno, red pepper, sesame. We okay. know you like spicy. Okay, perfect for me. Okay. And the great thing is you can actually eat the skin with this uh, delicato yes. squash, huh? Very nice with the uh, skin. Yeah. We don't have to peel them. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to garnish with a with, uh, little... Nori. Okay. Just kind of like that. A little more. And rice is already seasoned already, so yeah. I think this is good like that. So that's delicata squash. Okay. So we have here, we pickled uh, lotus in uh, sugar and vinegar. Uh huh. And this one is cooked in soy sauce. Okay. And yeah. this one is fried. This one's fried. Crispy. Yeah. One piece of this. So this is nice and sweet, the white one. Yeah. And then uh, a brown one is uh, salty. Okay. So we'll put both in one. Just kind of form it into sushi shape. There we go. And then we can garnish it with a little crispiness. There we go. We have Let's see. Oh, we can do onions. Onion, okay. How you call onion in Japanese? Tamanegi. Tamanegi, okay. Tamanegi. So we roasted onion really slow again. Yeah. Uh, with the skin. With the skin, It kind of okay. steams. Uh, and then we'll just use this nice ring from inside. Yeah. So in Japan, we make... Uh, dish called uh, ikameshi. It's uh, basically like a squid ring, ring of squid, uh -huh. filled with rice. Oh, it could be like that. It could look like a little bit like right? squid, huh? So, yeah. uh -huh. so we'll fill this up with uh, sushi rice. Okay, and little... This is yuzu miso, so it has a little bit of yuzu and miso for mm -hmm. flavor. with little shiso. Okay, looks great. Yeah. Very quick, but, and then I know you like the sweet glaze. Yeah, I love the glaze. So it can go around on the onions. Okay. There you go. Okay. All right, next one, we'll do, how about uh, pickled watermelon radish? Okay. So watermelon radish are, they really look like watermelon. Yeah. Nice bright Probably. red inside. Yeah. 
So you pickle them again okay. with a little vinegar? A little vinegar, a little sugar, a little bit of ginger. Uh-huh. What is that, ginger? That's ginger. Who cut it so fine, or you grated it? No, I cut it so fine with the oh. knife. Wow, great. I can actually... Uh, Use a knife really yeah, well. Yeah. yeah. Good job. <laughs> Thanks for teaching me. Finally. <laughs> okay. So let's use the little chive here that I blanched previously so that it sticks together. It sticks together, rice in the. Squish it so it doesn't fall. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, we're only at eight. We said ten. Okay, I have more coming. Okay, good. So why don't we do eggplant? Okay. Okay. So eggplant. I scored them really fine. Yeah. Deep fried first. Yeah. And then brined in vegetable dashi with a little bit of soy sauce for flavor. Okay. Okay. Bit. I know you like eggplant. Yeah, I love eggplant. Yeah. Also, you can eat the skin now when it's cut like that. It's yes, so it's going to be beautiful, mm -hmm. tender. Mm -hmm. It's not too much uh, texture on your teeth, you know. So again, we'll make it turn into sushi shape. And then uh, in my country, eggplant yeah. always with uh, ginger. Yeah, okay. So we'll do... In my country too. Same? Yeah. Oh, nice. See, we have so much in common. In Austria, yeah. yeah. We don't go out. Uh, eggplants come from Italy in Austria. <laughs> I mean, it's not the right climate. Okay. Uh, let's see what we got. Okay, we'll do one last one. It's going to be romaine lettuce. Again, from California. It's like yeah. a little Caesar salad, right? Yeah. So we grilled it first. Yeah. So, I'm going to take this. Now spice it up for me, okay? Okay, let's make it. Spicy with wasabi, maybe? Yeah. You decide. Okay. okay. And then we'll put some beautiful flowers. Okay. okay. That's omakase ten sushi. Okay. We're making the farmer's plate uh, based on everything that we just found in the market. So we're going to serve it with a chickpea puree, a muhammara, and a little burrata. So I just do the little nice dollop of chickpea puree. Like I said, the muhammara has um, it's uh, walnuts, a little uh, toasted bread, roasted peppers, a little spoonful of this local burrata. For me, it's just all the things I would want to eat with the, with the vegetables, a little pepper on there. And then I'm just gonna take uh, some of the red curry squash from Peter, some of the Romanesco from Milliken, some of Tamai's green beans, some of James Birch's Jimmy Nardello peppers, some Laubacher Farms carrots. And again, a little of a, a Shaner's, like end of the summer squash. And I'm just gonna do a little salt, pepper, nice big squeeze of lemon, a little drizzle of olive oil. Just want them to get nicely seasoned. 
just kind of about layering them with a little bit of our beautiful dandelion from Coleman. Just kind of trying to layer everything, showing off all their different pretty shapes, different colors. Let's get that a little glazed. And then in the end, I'm just going to use some of those pretty little Munak tomatoes because it's, again, I was saying, like to have that nice little burst of, of something fresh and acidic. Just make sure those get seasoned. And then I'm just going to tuck them in. With a little, little juicy surprise in there. And then we just serve that with a grilled toast. And that is, that is the farmer's plate. Adobo is a Filipino dish made with meat, seafood, or vegetables braised in soy sauce, vinegar, herbs, garlic, bay leaves, and peppercorns. I was inspired by this classic flavor profile to make a vegetarian twist on adobo with cauliflower and eggplant. Let's get started. In a pan, combine soy sauce and Knorr Professional Liquid Concentrated Vegetable Base, white vinegar, bay leaves, crushed garlic, and cauliflower cut into florets. Bring this to a simmer and reduce, stirring occasionally. Cover until the cauliflower is tender. Once tender, remove the cauliflower and continue to reduce the liquid until it thickens into a syrup. Once the liquid is thickened, add the cauliflower back into the pan, as well as some deep fried and diced Japanese eggplant. Reheat the sauce so that it makes a nice glaze over the vegetables. Garnish with the sliced scallions and serve. Savory, sweet, and tart. Your guests will love this cauliflower and eggplant adobo made with Knorr Professional Liquid Concentrated Vegetable Base. Enjoy. <laughs> 